You know, there's a war that it, we see played out throughout the Bible. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. And it's a war that continues in the lives and the hearts of people in the 21st century. Jesus framed that war with these words on the Sermon of the Mount when he said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Notice that he didn't say you should not serve both God and money. He said you cannot serve both God and money. It's not something that we are humanly able to do is to keep this, yes, I can do this and give myself wholeheartedly to money and at the same time give myself wholeheartedly to God. It just doesn't work. We cannot do it, he says. Now, people who find themselves loving and serving money are often known as people that are materialistic, people who worship at the altar of materialism. Now, I think it's very clear that we understand that the Bible does not condemn people for being rich. He does not condemn them. In fact, if when you go through the Old Testament, you will read about Abraham, who we consider the father of the faith. And he was a man who had, uh, he was extremely rich. And so was Job. In the New Testament, you have Joseph of Arimathea and Zacchaeus, possibly even Barnabas, who were people who had money, but did not worship their money. In his congregation in Jerusalem, we see that the gospel had touched every segment of society. So James talks to one segment of his society in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And he said, look here, you rich people, weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible trouble ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away, and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. And continues in verse 4, for listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. Would you want to be there for that message? That was just kind of straight and direct. But I want us to notice that James' condemnation of them was for three specific things. And, and it was these things. Number one, how they got their wealth. How they got their wealth. How did they get it? Well, he said that they cheated those who worked for them, holding back wages and holding back payments that they should have made. Now, this was talked about in the Old Testament. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says very clearly, when you get into the promised land, when somebody works for you, He's a daily worker. At the end of that day, pay them because you do not know if they need that to survive to the very next day. But they were holding it back. People were doing things for them and they were saying, no, I'm just going to hold on to my money. It makes interest where I have it and that's better than handing it over to you. I remember when we built this building, our builder 
came to us early on in the process and says, I want you to know one thing. We have to make sure that at the end of this project, we have the money to pay everybody that we are going to use. And my first thought was, well, of course. And he goes, no, no, you don't understand. He said, the common practice in building is you build what you're going to build, and then if you run out of money, you just don't pay your subcontractors. I said, what? He said, yeah, that, that's standard operating procedure in the building profession. In fact, the bigger the company is, as far as the one that's hiring people out, the bigger they are, the more they don't pay their particularly smaller contractors. And when they try to take them to court to get the money, the big companies have more lawyers than the little companies can afford, so many of them end up going out of business simply because they don't get paid. And he said, I won't have anything to do with that practice. And I said, I'm game. We're not going to have anything to do with that practice either. In fact, there are things about this building that to this day haven't been done that we planned on 16, 17 years ago because simply you didn't have the money to pay. But the rich people at that point in time, as so many rich people do today, they held back what they should have been paying out and took people to court because the court favored the rich and not the poor. So James condemned them on how they got their wealth. James also condemned them on how they used their wealth. He said they stored it up for their own security, for their own benefit. At the same time, they kept others from benefiting from it while they, it says in verse 5, lived lives of luxury. So it's like the little guy stayed little because the big guy kept doing what he wanted to do for his own benefit. And then the third thing is, he got on to them because of what would happen because of their wealth. So how they got it, how they used it, and what would happen because. And he listed. In verse 1, he said that it would create trouble for them. How many of you have ever thought, if I just had a lot more money, all my trouble would be over? How many of you have thought that? How many of you got more money and then realized that really didn't solve it? Oh, yeah. That, that didn't, didn't quite do it. Why? Because sometimes just having more creates more problems. And so it said it would rot away and vanish, it would eat away at their character, and it would eventually bring judgment on them. Now, Jesus called out, or James called out the rich people because of their materialistic ways. But nowhere does he give us the guardrail to keep us from falling into those traps. But if we'll go to read what Paul has to say, he's the one that gives us the guardrail for our life. So I want you to write this down. Generosity is the guardrail that protects me from materialism. Generosity is the guardrail that protects me from materialism. Now, Paul addressed the rich when he was talking to Timothy. But before we go any further on this, I, I want to stop and address a question that I'm sure is running through your mind. And it's this. What does being rich have to do with me? I mean, most of us here would not put ourselves in the rich category. We're not in the top 1%. Anybody agree to that? 
we're going, we're probably not in the top 10% when you come and think about it. We, we don't fit. So you're going, you're, you're preaching to the wrong crowd, Russell. You've got to go down the street. You've got to go somewhere else. But I, but I want to say this. When we look at the worldwide statistics, we get a very different picture. When we look at household wealth by country, the United States and those of us who live here control 31.5% of the world's money. And guess how, how many percentage points we are of the population? Four. Four percent of the world handles 31% of the money. When you look at it by country and you look among the medium income of the world, it looks different. Now, again, you won't have time to look at all this, so let's just do the paint by numbers thing and look at the colors. The dark green are the ones that have the most, and everyone else has a lot less. Where do you live? The most. You're going, well, see, where I live, we should have taken a little part out and put a different color there. Again, we're, we're talking overall. All it takes for you and I is to do some traveling, and we figure out quickly that we are indeed in the top. We are blessed, not because of us. But we are blessed. I remember a video years ago where the guy said, we always say God bless America. He already has. So what are we doing about it? Think about that for just a second. And now as we look at it, now as we listen to Paul's words about being rich, let's admit that he's talking to you and me. Today, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. This is an amazing passage, and this is one you ought to stop and meditate on yourself. This has so many things in it. It says, first of all, don't let being rich make you proud. I, I have come to believe in what I call national sins. And you're going, what do you mean national sins? Well, some countries, if not all countries, are known by something. And sometimes what they're known for is not necessarily good. As we travel around the world and as we ask people what they think about Americans or America, they would say, by and large, they're very proud. Now, I understand everybody should be proud of their country. That's, that's, that's a different day. But there's a difference between being proud of our country and just being proud. And so many times, when we look at the root cause of that, our pride comes back to what we looked at before. We control 31.5% of the world money. We got more. We must be better, proud. 
And yet, one of the first things Paul says is, tell those that are rich in this world not to be proud. Don't, let your, don't put your trust in the money. Keep your trust in God. Why? Because money is so unreliable. Money is so unreliable. If you've lived in other parts of the world, sometimes you've run into this more so than we see it day by day here. I remember when I was growing up in Peru one time, one day the dollar was worth 27 soles. The next day, the dollar was worth 48 soles. Guess what? If you had dollars, it was a great day. If you had soles, all of a sudden, whatever you had was only worth half. This happens all the time. Now, we don't feel that because we're not changing money very often here in the States. And yet, let's be honest, when the prices go up and our salaries stay the same, what's that saying about the value of the money? It's kind of going down. It's so unstable. You go, Russell, but see, I, I, I got it in the stock market. <laughs> Good. Until the stock market goes down. All of these things that have to do with money, they're so volatile. And it says, don't put your trust in the money. Keep your trust in God. Then in verse 18, it says, use your money for good by giving it away to do good for others. In other words, God has a purpose here in this life. He cares for all of his creation, and consequently, he gives us ways and opportunities that we can not only benefit from ourselves, but we can help others. Again, I'm reading the book of Deuteronomy. It's, it's three messages given in one day. You think my messages are long? Hang around for Moses, okay? 34 chapters long, given in one day. And throughout, he gives us some all kind of things, and he's talking about, okay, and when you get into the land that I'm giving you, when you have your crops, don't pick every single thing off of a limb. Leave a little bit there. Why? So that those who don't have as much can come by and pick some fruit for themselves. Give them the dignity of working to get it for themselves, but provide a safety net so that everyone is taken care of. God is that kind of God. He cares about everyone. And then it tells us here in verse 19, don't store up what you have on earth, store it up in heaven. You're going, okay, whoa, whoa, what does that mean? Well, it means that the things you do that are within what God wants done, you are lending to him. In fact, in another part it says, when you give to the poor, you are lending to God, and he will pay you back. But some people say, no, I, I, it, it's mine. It's mine. That, that's a problem, because it's not. It's not ours. In fact, Jesus put it very clearly again in Matthew chapter 6, when he said, don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroy them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. 
Have you ever bought a brand new car? I mean, it's, it's brand new. You got this car. I mean, if, if you bought a brand new car in the last, oh, I'll say five years, you spent more than I paid on my first house. Okay? And so you, you've got this brand new car, and you're going down the road, and a bird poops on the windshield. It's your brand new car. You find the first place and you wash the car. Why? Because your treasures is in this thing. You, this is important. This is valuable. You wash the car. Give it five years. Bird poops. Turn on the windshield wiper. Smear it a bit. Put a little water on and keep driving. Right? Why? Because it's no longer the treasure part. But where your treasure is, there's your heart. And it says, now listen, don't take things and put them here. Why? Because everything you and I try to hold on to here can be stolen or it breaks down or just rots away. Remember, you got that house, the one you... You just, you just had to have, and you got it, and you go, okay, this is now mine. Well, really the banks, but mine. Till the first hurricane comes. And then it goes, Phew. Everything we have, they can steal our money. It, 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 it breaks down. It rots away. All of these things. That is what happens with the stuff here. Well, see, Russell, that's why I don't do that. I don't deal I, with banks. I don't trust banks. That's why I buy gold. Let me give you a secret. Thieves steal gold, too. Everybody got that? It all can be taken care of. Why are we saying this? Not because I need more offering. That's, that's not even the point. The point is, if you try to keep it and hide it and hold it and not let God use it for the purposes that he gave it to you in the first place, you will lose it. But when we say, no, I am simply the instrument and I will then give it forward, pay it ahead, be generous and store it in heaven. Then, then you've got something you can count on. Because God is the best giving banker around. His interest is out of this world, literally. So, I think it would help us to remember what Marcel told us about a while ago. We learned this back in January when we did a line. And this was the foundation number one of it all. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything. You and I don't own anything. Everything we have has been given to us by him, and we are simply using it for his purposes or for our purposes. We are managing, and we are to manage, and what was the word we learned from Marcel? We are to manage an M-A-X. Ah, it's A-X. All it took is three letters. Maximize. Everything for who? For him. Everything we have belongs to God. So the question is, how can I make generosity a guardrail for my life? Because James told us the dangers that are on this side. And Jesus laid out for us the things the way it should be on this side. So what can I do to set up this guardrail of generosity in my life? As I've done, I think every time I preach, I'm telling you what I have to do. 
I, I think it will work for you. I think it would be good for you, but I'm not telling you to do it. This is what I have to do. Number one, I must grow in the grace of giving. I must grow in the grace of giving. Say, Russell, when, when did you start giving? The earliest recollection I have of, of giving, I was five years old. I, I remember because my dad always gave us whatever allowance we got was always with 10 coins. And so we were in Costa Rica and he gave us 10 centimos, which is 10 cents. And I got 10 of those. And he said, okay, this, I'm giving you this. Now, God says if you'll give him this one, he'll make sure he takes care of you with everything else. I thought that was a fair deal. I still got to keep nine. So I remember I take the one, and that's what I give in the offering. You go, you, you gave a dime? Yeah, that, that was it. And then I'd run to the store with 50 centimos, and I would buy peanuts. You're going, you spent half your allowance on peanuts? I love peanuts. So yes, that's what I did. What would you do with the other four? I don't remember, but if I ever found a, another one, I would go back with those five and buy more peanuts. That was just me. That was my five-year-old five mentality. Now, I've grown a little bit. I don't buy as many peanuts as I used to. But my giving has also grown. And no matter how old I am, every year I have a conversation with God about what do you want me to do this year in order to continue to grow in the grace of giving. Why? Because I learned that what I did 10 years ago and 30 years ago isn't enough for today. I have to keep growing in the grace of giving because materialism will catch me at any stage of life. It will do its best to grab a hold of me, get me to focus more on money than on God. But the antidote for that is to grow in the grace of giving. Now, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, Paul talks to, about the, to the Corinthians about the churches in Macedonia and gives them some wonderful things, and you can go there on your own and look at it. But one of the things that it points out is this. The churches in Macedonia were not only poor, they were abundantly poor. So to use our terminology, they weren't poor, they were po. They couldn't even afford the O and the R at the end of that word. They were really, really poor, and yet they abounded in generosity. They were extremely generous without having much to do with. So here's a principle. Generosity is not based on what I have. It's based on who I've given my heart. Right now, our internet's not working, so we're not live streaming this. So I can talk about Beverly, and she won't hear it live. When, when, when she was in 10th grade, I was in the first year of college, and we were dating. She had 30 minutes for lunch. I would be outside. She would run out because you could leave campus if you wanted to, and we would run, get something to eat together. But we didn't go to McDonald's or Whataburger in Texas. I went to El Dorado, which was not a furniture shop. It was a great little restaurant, wonderful steak. We would eat. 
She always got back to school late. I'm not recommending this. By the way, students, don't do this. This is a bad thing to do. But, and the meal, it was expensive. We we're talking six or seven bucks for two of us. And you're going, Russell, that's no big deal. I made 75 bucks a week. I blew 10% on one meal. You're going, Russell, why would you do that? Because I had given my heart to her. And when you give your heart, then generosity is not a problem. The other day I saw a t-shirt and, and it says, don't call me grandma, call me Grandma Claus. And I thought, that's right, that's right. Why? Because once you're in that club, you, you just do anything. Why? It's not based on what I have. It's based on who I've given my heart. Second thing about generosity in verses 6 through 8 of that chapter says, generosity says more about my love for God and others than whatever I might say with my mouth. See, our love is expressed in generosity. I, I can give without loving, and some people do. It's strictly a transactional thing. But I cannot love without giving. It just, it's just natural. And when there's a love relationship with the Lord, when we begin to love the things that the Lord loves, then being generous with those things is a natural outpouring of that. So if I'm going to set this up, I have to grow in the grace of giving. Second, growth will come with increased faith and obedience. Increased faith and obedience. See, I will grow in faith as I trust God to do more while I keep less. When people talk in terms of percentages of their giving, you look at people and they say, okay, Russell, I'm just not making it good with with." what I have. How am I going to take a percentage of that? Whatever the percentage is. How am I going to take a percentage and give it away and make it on the rest? I can't do that. And yet, when it's something between them and God and they're responding to God working in their heart and they do it, and God responds by doing more with less that we have, our faith grows. I know people who, who started giving, and they said, okay, I'm going to give 10%. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I can live on the rest. I'm already over budget anyway, but I'm going to give 10%. And then after trying that out for a while, realized, wow, it's amazing what all God can do with me doing that. And so they increase it and they say, okay, Lord, now I'm going to give 12%. And I'm just going to keep 88%. And then they realize, wow, look what God has done. I once read a story about a guy who started that. And he started giving 10 and keeping 90 and he was so impressed with how God blessed him, he moved that up to 20, and he kept 80. And throughout his life, he kept going till he got to the point where he was giving 90, and he kept 10. And the God that was able to do it one way continued to do it the other. Now you're saying, are you telling me if I give 90, God's going to... I'm not telling you anything. What I'm telling you is, when we give to 
what God thinks is important. He makes sure that we're taken care of from there. I will grow in faith as I trust God to do more while I keep less, but I will grow in obedience when I learn to give both systematically and spontaneously. Those are my two big words for the message. Systematically and spontaneously. Hmm. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul again is talking, and he said to the Corinthians, on the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. The first day of each week. You're going, Russell, but I, I, I don't get money every week. Guess what? You don't have to do anything. But if I get money during the week, the first day of that week, I need to set aside a portion of that money for God. The Old Testament, we have the first fruits. The Old Testament, we have the tithe. Jesus affirms the tithe in the New Testament. And Paul never uses the word tithe. He just says, here's the deal. Every week, everyone... You ought to set aside something. Again, go back to Deuteronomy. It said, never show up. Never show up to worship God empty-handed. Because God has been too good to show up with nothing to give back to him. Systematic giving is the foundation on which all generosity rests. When, when our idea of generosity is wing it when I feel it, that's not a sound basis. Give when I have it left over, not a sound basis. It's systematic giving that becomes the foundation on which all of my generosity then can rest. But then there's also spontaneous giving. And spontaneous giving should be the obedient response to God moving in my life. Not an emotional response to an emotional appeal. We've all, well, if we haven't already, you will begin to see some amazing emotional appeals on television. And there are some stations you can go to and especially the ones that don't charge much for the ads, they get, I mean, a ton of them. You'll see a starving kid somewhere, and they want you to give. You'll see a, a, a hurting kid somewhere else. You'll see all kind of emotional appeals. And if our giving is simply based on emotions, we're in trouble. Because let's be honest, our emotions can go all over the place. But when it's in response to obedience, when God shows us something, when God speaks to us about something, and we obey him in that, now we're growing in obedience. Have you ever had God show you something and you felt in your heart you ought to do that and you go... But, but, but no, I, no I, I, I can't make it if I, if I do that. Let me tell you something. You missed an opportunity to grow. Spontaneous giving is in response to obedience for what God wants done. Give me a third thing with this I finish. Generosity to others will be possible because of God's generosity to me. I love this verse. I've read it, I've used it, I've followed it, I've proven that it's true. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over 
to share with others. Wow. That's what generosity will do. Notice how big that is. He will generously provide not just what you need. There will always have everything you need and plenty left over. A person with a heart that God can trust will never lack the material things needed to be able to be generous with others. You say, where did you learn this, Russell? At home. Watching my dad. All my life, he not only taught me to give, I watched someone with a heart for other people. I remember one time dad came back from Costa Rica. And when he was in Costa Rica, he had been with our missionary, John Barnes, there. And he told them, John, what you need to, to really make this movement really go, you need a youth camp. God does stuff at youth camp, and you need to have a camp. And they go, well, we don't have property. We don't have this. He said, you don't need all that. You just need some tents. You just need some basic thing. You can rent a field and have an amazing camp. And he goes, okay. And I remember dad coming back and sitting down in the office and picking up the phone and calling people, hey, there's a guy in Costa Rica and they really need a camp. And I watched him in two days raise enough money to literally buy all the tents all the equipment for them to have their first camp. And then went back the following year and was there for the camp. From the people that I hear about, it was an amazing thing. Among other things, it rained the entire week. It was one big mud fest. And yet... God did an amazing things in the life of men and women at that camp. Today, they don't do that. They have a really cool, big camp. And literally hundreds of men and women have given their life to the Lord and are pastoring churches and going and doing things for Him today. You see, when God says... Rudy, ask people for it. It's not for you. Give it to somebody else. When God can trust you to do that, he'll use you. You ever heard anybody say, you know, if I just won the lottery, I could do a whole lot of things for God? Have you ever heard something like that? Any of you ever thought it? Of course you have. We've all done it. I've... I, I, I go up, every time I go to the airport, Fort Lauderdale, I see the big sign and figure out everything I could do with what's up there. And when you go the whole turnpike, you've got a long time to start talk about it. But you know what? If God can't trust you with $100, he's certainly not going to give you 100000 We have to show God that he can trust us that we can be generous, that we won't be tied to the love of the money. But if we do, there are people sitting in our congregation, people you would never know or expect who do amazing things for God around the world. Why? They figured it out. If I'm generous, that will protect me from being materialistic. If I'm generous, God can use me to do things that there is no other way I could have pulled off. If I will just grow in my faith and in my obedience, God can do amazing things. I want to end with two questions. Just something for you to think about. 
Who are you serving? God or money? God or money? Second, can God trust your heart to be generous with others? Take those things and think about them. Write them there on the bottom of the page. Ask God to, to help you flesh that out. What does that mean? And then obey and watch God do amazing things. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you today and I'm so grateful for your word. I'm so grateful for the things in your word that talk about this real war, tying us to this earth or doing things for you. These, these battles that go on between serving God and serving money. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would help us. Show us how to avoid being tied to the things that when it's all said and done, we're all just going to disappear. Help us get on the same page as you. Help us to accomplish the things you want accomplished in the lives of others. Help us, dear Lord, to be generous in a way that brings honor and glory not to us, but to you. And we'll thank you for it all in your precious name. Amen.